I'd like to welcome Rick Clark to the Ag Emerge stage. Rick is a farmer himself, in fact, a large-scale farmer, and you're going to hear more about the scale of his farming enterprise. But what I find interesting is how Rick has taken on his own, and he's just not been afraid of change. He's not afraid of what his parents or grandparents have done or thought, and he's powered forward to really affect change on his farm. One of the key concepts that he really pioneered is planting green. On my own farm, we've been doing this for several years now. In fact, we were one of the very first farms, if not the first, that created a uh, planting corridor within cover crops where we'd leave a corridor to plant the plants. Well, Rick has done this in just heavy vegetation planting that you're going to see and has been very successful at it. So regenerative just isn't for small-scale farmers or backyard farmers. It's for large-scale farmers. And I encourage you to really think about that for your operation and take what Rick has done to make things better and think about how you can make things better on your farming operation. Welcome, Rick Clark. Hi, this is Rick Clark. I'm a fifth generation farmer from West Central Indiana, and I'm honored to be presenting today at the 2021 Ag Emerge. I cannot thank Monty and Kim enough for having me here today. I am going to try to describe my journey today of where we were, where we are, and where we think we're heading on our farm today. Um, from the generations prior to me, we were some of the worst soil destructors of the county. Uh, I'm sad to say that, but that's the way we used to farm. Um, and I continued down that path. I, I've graduated from a major university uh, in the Midwest, and I was taught uh, certain ways to farm, and I was taught those same ways from my father. And today, I can proudly say that I do nothing like that today. And that is where we need to be changing our thought process and be thinking about how we can, we can save the soil that we have, this precious resource, and how we can save the planet. And it can all happen right now. I'm gonna take you back, way back to the beginning. Um, we were, like I said, we tilled the soil a lot. If it didn't turn black in the fall, you had not tilled it enough. And we were doing that, I, I, I don't remember the years on this, but it was just sometime in the past, uh, 18 years ago or so, um, we were prepping a field in the spring. It was a bean stubble field, and, and it, it was the common practice. We were gonna work it twice with a field cultivator, and when you're done, you're not gonna have anything out in that field bigger than a golf ball, and it's gonna look awesome. That was the thought process. So we went out and we prepped 400 acres like this. And we let it sit because, of course, we were in there too soon. The field wasn't fit to plant, so we had to be in there to work it up, to dry it out, to make it fit to plant, which seems absolutely ridiculous today, but, but that's what we did. Well, Mother Nature decided to rain an inch. And you're going to hear me mention Mother Nature many times in this 17-minute presentation. Mother Nature is, is the driving force that has guided me on where she's wanted me to go on this journey. It rained one inch that night that we'd prepped that soil earlier in that day. It rained one inch that night. The next morning, I was anxious to get up to get to the field to see how soon we could be possibly planting because it was a new spring. We were ready to go. I could not believe how far the soil had moved in that one inch rain event. It had already headed toward the ditch uh, going into the, the waterways and heading down the streams and going to go into the, the Gulf of Mexico. That was my epiphany right there. I woke up and said, something has to change. Now becomes the implementation of no-till. So you start down the no-till road. And it's like anything else that's, that's out of your normal wheelhouse. It's scary. You don't know for sure what's going to happen but you know in your heart that there's got to be a different way to do this. So we start no-tilling. So then we'd been no-tilling for probably three or four years, 
and then it was it was uh, time to start looking at cover crops. Um, I've had I've got a neighbor that's not too far away that has been already doing no tilling for several years, and and he's also been doing uh, some cover cropping. So I knew nothing about what we were going to do, and the first thing I, I researched was tillage radish. I don't know why, but tillage radish is what came up. And the reason why this is important is because if you're going to step out of your comfort zone and, and make a change to your farming style, you have to have success that first time out of the gate. I think that's very critical because I'm, I'm afraid if you don't have success, you may not come back to this concept. So it's important that you do your research, you talk to the, the correct people, and you get this comfort zone starting to build tillage radish. We planted 200 acres of tillage radish. I think I planted them. I was overzealous. Everyone said, you know, two pounds is plenty. I think we planted six and the, the growing season was perfect and it was just an explosion of tillage radishes in that fall. And you know when you've hit the home run with tillage radish in that middle of January when it's frozen and they are rotting and decaying and it smells something like you can't imagine, you know you've done it good with tillage radish and that's where we were. Came out the next spring, we had no uh, cover crop that was growing because tillage radish winter kills. We no-till planted into that, um, that field of tillage radish. We still used some chemicals at that point and at the end of the fall, that fall, that was our best yielding cornfield that we had on the farm. That right there, it, that's it, that's all it took. Mother Nature showed me with that one inch rain event to move that freshly tilled soil, it woke me up. I had success on that first attempt at cover crop and now we're rolling. So now I'm thinking, I'm not gonna hold anything back. The next year, it was 2,000 acres of cover crop. The year after that, it was 6,000 acres. Then by the third year, we were all the way in to cover crop. So now, now, now here's the next uh, Mother Nature paradigm shift for me. The plan was to have 1,500 acres of corn planted into cereal rye, and then we were gonna terminate uh, chemically and then grow the corn out of this cereal rye. Okay, one of the rules that I had made early was we will never terminate cover crops until after we have planted. So with that being said, I got through planting a 300 acre field. I think I got done at two in the morning. Well, I just said we don't terminate until after we plant. Well, I'd parked the planter, I got home by 3 or 3.30, went to bed, and when I got up, it was raining. And it rained for three inches. We could not get in and spray, so time kept going by. Now the rye is growing prolifically. It's almost three feet tall now. The corn is emerging out of the ground, and, it, and it's just about ready to go in and we can spray. Rain's another two inches. Mother Nature is showing me, uh, she's giving me humility here, and she's showing me that there's another way to do this. Long story short, we finally got the corn, or I'm sorry, we finally got the cereal rye spray terminated when it was five and a half feet tall. The corn was, uh, was eight inches tall, eight to ten inches tall, and it looked absolutely pathetic. Yellow, spindly and it, it looked like chalk this one up and start over. But I was bound and determined to stick it out. So I figured the first thing we gotta do to save this corn is we've gotta get some nitrogen out here to this corn. So we spread AMS. I like AMS at this point in where we were in our journey because the, uh, the ammonium is much more stable and it has sulfur and almost all of our fields need sulfur today. So we spread 150 pounds broadcast of AMS. We finally got the cereal rye terminated and it took until August the 8th to know if there was even a cash crop growing in there. 
took that long for the cereal rye to melt down and, and expose the corn. Again, that field was our second best yielding field on the farm that fall. You know, Mother Nature did it again. Rick, you need to be farming green. That's the term I use, farming green. We plant our cash crop of corn and soybeans into a living, growing green cover crop. And we do not terminate that cover crop until after we've planted. Now that's the corn scenario. Okay, so now, I'm on, remember, I'm on my journey here. So at that point in time, we were still using traded corn and chemicals. That's why we were able to spray the Roundup on the cereal rye after the corn had emerged. Okay, let's keep moving through time. Now I, I need to uh, give, give uh, honor where honor is due, and that's Dr. Aaron Silva at the University of Wisconsin. I was very fortunate enough to go to one of her classes. There was, there was myself and about 40 other farmers in this room. Dr. Silva taught us how to plant soybeans into cereal rye at boot stage and then in 40 days, plus or minus a few days, when that cereal rye is in anthesis, we're gonna roll, crimp the whole thing down. The beans, the cereal rye, everything, it's all going down. You can't do that. You can't crimp soybeans, you're gonna kill them. Well, no you won't. Dr. Silva showed us how to do it. I went home, I listened to what she had to say, I ran it through my mind. We decided to do it. The next spring, best beans we had that fall. Unbelievable. So you see, everywhere, I'm blessed through this. Everywhere, every step of this journey, I've had the, I've been in contact with the right people. And that is huge. And Mother Nature, again, I have to give her all of the credit because she is absolutely guided where she's wanted me to go. So now, what this has done, this style of farming soybeans, what this is, this is, this is, this is very complex now. Our farm has totally been ripped inside out, upside down, pulled out. I've done everything you can imagine. It's nothing like it used to be. When I went to school and my dad did the same thing, corn is king. You have to plant corn first and don't worry about your soybeans. They're just a secondary crop. How untrue that statement is, it's unbelievable. So now when I start to think about the, the master plan here, we are no longer applying any synthetic fertilizers to our farm. We've not applied any P or K in seven years. We haven't applied any ag lime in seven years. And the reasons why we can do these things is because we've let these cover crops go way far into their maturity and we've let them do what they were intended to do. If it was a cereal grain, it was intended to give a soil erosion control, armor the soil and sequester nutrients. If it's a legume, its job is to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. And that nitrogen now is what we use to grow our corn. We no longer use synthetic nitrogen as well and we no longer use them, uh, any manure. Everything we're doing is natural as we can possibly be. So now let's go back to the, the soybean scenario and I'm gonna wrap all this together. If you want to follow my journey and come out to this island that I'm standing on, I'd love to have you because I need some company. There's many things we've got to keep in mind here. I've told you that we are growing our nitrogen. Well, if you want to maximize what that legume is going to do for you, you cannot go out the first warm day of spring and burn it to the ground with chemicals. You can't do this any longer. We need to let these legumes grow. So now I'm talking after Mother's Day. So Mother's Day is around May 10th, May 12th timeframe, plus or minus a few days. So let's just pick May 20th. I don't want to plant corn again before May 20th. This is perfect with the soybean scenario because the soybean scenario, we're planting soybeans at boot stage. And in the region that I am from in the world, 
It's just west central Indiana. I'm 15 miles above Interstate 74, straight east of Champaign, Illinois. That ought to zero it in pretty good. We can get to boot stage typically around April the 25th, plus or minus a couple days. So we are now planting beans at the last week of April. And we're waiting on those legumes to fix the nitrogen that they're doing and everything's perfect. So we're going to roll as hard as we can. We're going to plant beans. And then in 40 days, somewhere around June 1st, we're going to be rolling those beans down with the cereal rye. We've terminated the rye. And now we've totally eliminated a burn down pass. Total. So now this is what got me to thinking, well, gosh, we are so close to organic. Let's just go the next step and let's just eliminate chemicals totally on our bean program. And that's what we did. So now we are I mean, we are driving inputs into the basement here. We are striving to be a low cost input producer while still maintaining yield, if not increasing yield. And by the way, that's my definition of soil health. I get asked that question all the time. Rick, what is your definition of soil health? It's, it's this simple. As inputs go down and yields still go up, how could we not be building soil health? It's just that easy. So don't make this hard, don't make it complex. And, and, and remember, that what is happening today is so important. This networking at these conferences, we have to have these conferences. Um, there is so much going on, not only when the speakers are speaking, the hallways, the, 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 the restaurants afterwards. It's very important that you continue to network and continue to, to, to make yourself better. So I want to wrap this up with change is good. Change is hard. It's very hard to get out of the way that you're doing it because your ancestors have been doing it that way for many years. And I'm not here to put down the way anyone's farming. That's not what I'm about. I'm only trying to show you a better way or maybe another way or something that's different. But it begins with change. And then the last thing I want to say is it is critical that you have success on the first attempt and it's also critical that you understand that you cannot jeopardize the livelihood of your farm. You're going to hear a lot of great speakers throughout this conference and you're going to get all charged up. But you have to control yourself and you cannot go out and jeopardize your whole farm this next coming spring. You've got to go slow, take it easy, get built into a comfort, and then let her rip. I can't thank you enough for letting me to speak here at your conference today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much.